Hey everybody. So this is going to be a quick video wrapping up what we were talking about, about visual perception. Specifically, we're going to talk about um, neural processing of visual information after the PVC, after the striate cortex, PD1 and PD2. So, so, all right. So remember, PD1 and PD2 are the striate cortex. And they, and they process the basic cross or the basic features of the visual signal. <laughs> Outside of uh, the striate cortex, we have certain secondary visual cortices. And these process more complex features. And if you remember back to you know, the kind of the features of the, the general features of sensory systems, is that as we move further up into the cortex, we get more and more complex and more and more specified uh, processing of the stimulus. And so you know, PVC, the PVC, the striate cortex, it processes the basic features of the signal. And then as we move higher up into the secondary cortices and then up beyond, we end up processing more specific things like D3 <coughs> uh, and DP, which, so there's, it's not entirely clear what these things process, but it seems like they process much more depth. Um, D4, uh, processes color. Um, there is a subsection of the sub, uh, secondary cortex, cortex called uh, in the MP that processes motion. Um, so your ability to detect motion is processed there. Um, and in fact, if you incur damage to the motor cortex or to this part of the sorry, to the MP uh, uh, secondary cortex of the, of the visual cortex. You actually become motion blind, um, meaning you can actually you actually don't see life as a continuous stream of events. I mean, you see life like a ticking DVD. Um, you know, so you know, in many ways, they they have more visual information than someone who is not entirely blind. But you know, it, it, there are a, a other major limitations. Um, <clears throat> now, you also have the MST, which helps process something called optic flow, um, which is kind of, put simply, it's your overall visual scene um, and how the adjustments of the visual scene as you move through it. Um, so you don't really have optic flow when you're stable and you're looking straight ahead, but as you start moving, uh, optic flow is created by your movement. Um, and yeah, so it's the perception and change of perception around you, or you're, you're changing your visual perception of things around you as you move through the environment. Now, that's processed by the MST cortex, which is a secondary visual cortex. So these areas process more specific features of the stimulus, not processed by the entire cortex. Now, Beyond the secondary cortices, information then gets carried out of the occipital cortex to other areas of the brain to, be, to process more specific features. So um, we have a traditionally the where and what pathway. So you have the where pathway carrying information uh, <clears throat> laterally to the inter interotemporal areas of the brain, whereas you have the dorsal pathway moving from the top, taking information uh, to, back to the posterior to the, uh, posterior parietal cortex. And these two different functions, these two different pathways carry that information to those areas to process different features of the stimulus. The information uh, carried laterally, the lateral pathway, or, or I guess it's actually called the ventral pathway, but it's more lateral. Um, but it's called the ventral pathway because it carries information down. That information is, when it arrives at the interior, interior temporal cortex, things about uh, what the uh, visual stimulus is become the process. So, for example, you know, I think I've mentioned a couple of times the Oliver Sacks book, The Man Who Mistook His Life for a Hat. Well, this individual had a tumor in his temporal cortex, which Obstructed part of the um, ventral pathway. 
<clears throat> so although he could describe the visual things that he was seeing, his ability to recognize and identify what they were was, was, was important. Um, the dorsal pathway, on the other hand, it carries information to the posterior parietal cortex. The parietal cortex is involved in visual spatial reasoning. So this helps us identify where things are in space and space. And so, you know, one kind of running joke example that I've used uh, is that, you know, if let's say you're in The Walking Dead and you get back in the back of the head by Negan, you're really hoping uh, that one of these pathways gets, uh, gets hurt more than the other. But either one is going to be incredibly harmful, provided you survive at all. So let's say it in interferes with your ventral pathway. So now you're unable to recognize who or what you're seeing. You're not going to be able to identify. And so if a zombie's coming at you, you're not going to be able to tell the difference between that zombie and maybe one of your allies. You're not going to be able to tell the difference between your allies or your enemies. So you know, walking around, just walking around, just seeing other people, just interacting with the environment is going to be hyper deadly because you're not going to be able to identify what things get. But potentially, you could just be hyper cautious and avoid everything. It could be more uh, from the Walking Dead uh, back in his crazy days. When, I'm sorry, back in his days where he was having some serious, but I think understandable issues. Um, uh, you would just want to avoid everybody and everything. Because you wouldn't be able to recognize the body. But if you got back closer to the top and the dorsal pathway got in, uh, was interfered with, you could still recognize things. You might, you know, when the zombie's coming at you, um, you, you, know, might, you might recognize that zombie as a zombie, but then because you can't uh, visual, visually, spatially reason where the zombie is relative to you, you might run smack that into it. So, <clears throat> you know, I guess you could really pick and choose which one you think would be more destructive. But the point is, is that um, these two different pathways help us provide different information about what it is we're seeing. Now, the graphic here that I've pulled also highlights the fact that um, these two pathways process different or influence different types of behavior. So, for example, um, one, one, uh, Study by Bala and Prophet, and then Bala, and then Bala. Uh, but anyway, uh, they they had participants run around with. Well, I think in one study they had them run for a mile, and the other one had them I think, either rest for the same amount of time the people ran or walk. I don't remember what the control condition was exactly, but um, they then had them stand at the base of the hill and make estimates about how steep the hill was, and they did so in two ways by uh, making a verbal estimation, um, and then by making an estimation, estimation using a contraption in which they were asked to replicate the angle or the incline of, of the hill. Well, when they made the estimations using the device, they were fairly accurate. But when they made verbal estimations of how steep the hill was, they, those who uh, had been who had run were more inaccurate than were those who had not. Specifically, those who had run overestimated the height of the uh, or the incline of the hill. So the idea is that this overestimation and the verbal uh, estimate of the incline of the hill was more affected by the ventral pathway, whereas the more accurate uh, estimate of the incline using the apparatus was more influenced by the dorsal pathway. The dorsal pathway pathway kind of helps you do the things necessary to get a job done with regards to what you're doing. So, so you know, the people, if regardless of whether they had run for a mile or not, if they were to climb the hill, they would still have to pick up their feet and extend them same, uh, in the same way that they would, regardless of whether they had run or not. Uh, but the people who had run, it's, it's going to take more effort for them. So by overestimating uh, the incline of the hill, they can prepare themselves for the effort that is going to uh, be involved in climbing that hill. Um, <clears throat> in another study, they, they just replicated that instead of having some people run and some people uh, not run, um, you know, the people, some people had heavy backpacks while they made their estimations and others didn't. It, again, the same thing occurred for the people who were burdened or for whom 
uh, climbing and inclined hill would be more difficult. They overestimated the incline when asked to verbally, but they were just as accurate as those in the control condition when estimating it using the apparatus. So these two pathways process different features of, the, of, of our visual environment. But in general, we can fairly safely say that um, the, the ventral pathway helps us process, you know, it helps us recognize things, of, things about the stimulus, uh, like certain uh, information based um, information, like recognition, whereas the dorsal pathway processes more kind of utilitarian features um, uh, of, the, of the vision stimulus, and where it is, how, how to interact with what to do. Uh, to get my own now, for example, you know, uh, talking about the fact that the ventral pathway is heavily involved in processing, uh, you know, in, for helping us recognize what we see. Uh, oh, here's a, another graphic showing kind of, you know, where things go. You know, the ventral pathway back moves here, and the dorsal pathway moves here. Um, but I wanted to highlight the superficial facial area um, because it's in the inferotypical cortex and it's responsible for processing faces. So if a person's superficial facial area is interfered with, so for the man who took his wife for hat, the, his uh, tumor was interfering with his superficial facial area. So he couldn't recognize his face. And so if anybody's area, excuse me, facial area is impaired, they tend to not be able to recognize faces. All right. Um, so, and again, you know, the, the, door, the ventral pathway is carrying that information down and around. So it's ventral, that's its name, and lateral. <clears throat> All right. And that, my friends, is that. And that's it for this video, and this is, that's it for all the videos that I had planned to post. Now, I'm going to be putting this video at the beginning of the playlist so that it wraps up our conversation of uh, the visual system. So the next couple videos in the playlist are the chemical sensors, and then after that, we'll start on the mechanical sensors from here. The first video that you get uh, from the, in this playlist is going to say, listen, the first video. Sorry. <laughs> Again, I forgot that I needed to cover this information too. Uh, but anyway, it's now covered. And we have all of it. And again, you know, most of this information, not all of it, but most of it is in the book. And so be sure to you know, have your book and follow along while you're going through all these things. All right, guys, that's it from me. Um, again, sorry for the fact that I'm in my room. Uh, Beard, say hey. Yeah. There you go. Uh, so, um, uh, I hope that you guys had a great weekend. And I, uh, I hope that these videos are useful. Um, but I will see everybody. See you then, guys.